Welcome everybody to Cultivate Farms Farm Tank, our farm pitching event for 2021. My name is Sam Marwood. I am the co-founder and CEO of Cultivate Farms. And we've been working with 25 farmers since November, you know, late, late, late 2020, with the support of Rural Bank uh, to help them develop their own farm investment pitch through our program called Cultivator. Now we've got seven farmers here today who are pitching and they're the ones who've been through the program have been hand selected to present to you today, the audience. Uh, this event is a culmination of their hard work and we're eager to uncover potential partners uh, to realize their farm investment dreams. They could be retiring farmers or investors. Uh, I just wanna commend these farmers for the efforts uh, and they've been putting themselves through and putting themselves out there uh, with these proposals is a big step. They put a lot of work into this and it takes a lot of courage. So I just wanna take stock and just congratulate them for getting this far uh, and for being part of this pitching event. So each cultivator participant has developed a two page farm investment summary and a three minute video. And we're gonna focus on the video today. If you would like to see their farm summary, farm investment summary, uh, get in touch, uh, send me an email, jump on the Cultivate Farms website uh, and we can connect you with that information. Um, we run Cultivator and we run Cultivate Farms to empower farmers. We know the best way for farmers to own a farm is to have a plan. And we help farmers develop their farm investment pitch and then work with them to uncover opportunities, you know, finding local investors and retiring farmers who want to share ownership. Sharing and, and partnering in business is the key for the next generation to own their farm. And we love the idea that these farmers will be now empowered to be working in their local community to uncover those people. There are people there and no doubt watching today who uh, would, would love to invest into a farm or partner with a farmer. Uh, and that's the point of this. We want these farmers to be empowered, pull a proposal together and uncover people. So I'll give a little bit more background around Cultivate Farms, walk through the event structure, introduce you to our team and the panel here. Uh, but we'll get going in five minutes, uh, but the bulk of this is going to be listening to the, the pitches and the interaction with the panel and, uh, and the farmers. So we are empowering the next generation of farmers. You know, the average age of farmers is increasing. Next gen farmers don't have a pathway to ownership and regional communities are in decline. And you know, in short, who is going to run our farms in the future? But we, we offer hope. That's what we do as Cultivate Farms. We know there are retiring farmers out there who will share ownership, who want to share ownership. And there are investors you know, in, in your local towns, in cities who would back good farmers if they're aware of the opportunities. And that's where we come in. We're, we're linking these parties, linking farm scale investments to investors. And we've made these matches. We we'll continue to make these matches. And out of this event, we're confident more matches are going to be made and more people are going to be inspired to follow their farm ownership dreams. So now to the panel. I want to introduce our panel and, uh, and get them to outline why they're here today uh, and why they're part of the panel. Uh, they will be the ones uh, asking questions directly of the panelists. But the audience, there is a chat function available. So please do jump in, offer your comments, uh, um, questions. We'll try and see if we can get to some questions if there are enough time um, allocated. Um, but please audience, jump in and interact uh, and have a conversation via the chat. We think that's really powerful. Um, but I wanna introduce the panel members and get them to say hello. So the first is Nigel Sharp. Nigel is the executive chair of Odonata Foundation. He wears many hats in the agriculture and uh, environment and investment space. Nigel, I think you're being our longest supporter uh, of what we're doing here at Cultivate Farms. I don't think we'd be here without that support, mate. And uh, do you just want to jump in and tell us, you know, why you're interested and why you're a part of what we're doing here at, with Cultivate and, and Cultivator specifically? Thanks, Sam. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm I'm a big supporter of Sam and a big supporter of Cultivator. I, there's a there's a there's a, um, a big need in in agriculture for uh, the next generation to have the opportunity to own farms uh, and also to bring through the next generation of farming expertise and and um, and and change that the industry's industry seeking. So I see that as a really um, um, core reason for supporting this. Um, I I back um, I back cultivate a cultivate farmer through Sam uh, and have really enjoyed that. Um, um, the progress that, that we're making there. Uh, and so on the back of that, um, uh, we're keen to back 
further farmers into um, through the cultivate model. Uh, so here as a, um, I guess, someone who's now got experience in working with Sam and working with a cultivate graduate um, and, uh, and wanting to see more success in the space. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, the next I'll go to is Bert Glover. Matt, he's Managing Director of Impact Ag. Uh, Bert has also been a long-term supporter of ours and we've had many phone calls, Bert and I, unpacking how do we uncover and support more farmers and make more investment uh, matches. Uh, Bert's doing some great things in the agriculture space, especially in the impact, um, in, hence the Impact Ag name uh, for his uh, business. Bert comes along to our cultivator programs uh, and he was at the, this, this one we've been running, um, giving inspiration that is possible to get matched with an investor. And then also here, he has already provided some tough love to uh, all these farmers as well along the way. But Bert, welcome. Um, yeah, just some background from you around why you're interested and why you're a supporter of what we're doing. Thanks, Sam. And, um, you know, I love your uh, inspiration and your passion for this, for this uh, venture and we'll always con continue to support you. I guess we see and we believe, Impact Ag Partners, we believe that um, agricultural investment, whether it's capital or human capital, whatever it is, whatever resource, um, can really catalyse change, not only for, for in addressing some of the current global challenges and for the current um, generation but future generations and I think it's really important and we love to support those aspiring next generation of farmers coming through we know it's challenging getting invested in this space so if there's a way that our firm can somehow support that next generation coming through whether it's through supporting you Sam in, in the cultivator program but getting more people on farm to take over the stewardship of this land because you know at the end of the day um, we're really only borrowing it from our children. And so if we can really uh, help young people get on assets, because let's face it, there's going to be more capital come to the space and that capital needs good partners and that's good management. And hopefully that's one thing that comes out of this process. So thanks, Sam. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Bert. Uh, now, Will Rayner. Uh, Will is the COO and divisional CFO at Rural Bank. And Rural Bank have been, again, great supporters of ours over the years. And specifically with this current cohort of cultivators, uh, we had many bankers of, and uh, as mentors across the country working with our farmers to pull together their, and, and pull apart their, their investment proposal. Um, but Will, thank you. And, uh, and just some reflections from you around what we're doing here with Cultivate Farms. Thanks, Sam. And uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, but Rural Bank, as the name would suggest, is, is a pure play agricultural lender. So we've got about $6 billion uh, invested in agriculture right across Australia. But ultimately, we see our role is to feed into the prosperity of agriculture rather than from it. And we know that bank debt, while it's an important part of capital structures for many farms, it's not the only answer, and nor should it be the only answer. And that in order to, to meet the great opportunities that exist in ag and and I won't steal Tony's thunder talking about the $100 billion target, but um, in order to meet the opportunities that agriculture provides, both in a production sense, but also the really important role it plays in rural and regional communities, it's going to require investment in capital from a, from a range of sources. And if we can get that right, if we can unlock the best, brightest and youngest people coming into the market uh, and into the sector, that, that's great for everyone and all participants. So uh, thanks, Sam. We're excited to be here and I'm looking forward to the pitches. Thank you, Will. And, and last um, panellist is Tony Ma, CEO of National Farmers Federation. And again, Tony's put up with a lot of my phone calls over the years, uh, unpacking what we're doing here at Cultivate Farms and uh, trying to see how we fit into the bigger agriculture industry and supporting that next generation and also the older farmers stepping back. So Tony, a few words from you around your, your um, interest in, in this area. Yeah, thanks, Sam. And um, congratulations to you and um, Cultivate Farms and can I also just say um, congratulations to the seven farm farmers, farm businesses uh, that are on, on the pitch today. It's a great idea um, and I'm really supportive of it um, whenever I can. I'm, I'm happy to continue supporting Sam and can cultivate farms. Hopefully we can bring everyone together as, um, as Will flagged, we've got, and hopefully you can see behind me, 
Um, we've hopefully established a narrative for the future of the ag sector that we need to grow the industry to $100 billion. And the way that we're going to do that is work together um, and completely agree with what Will said. We've got to get you know new people, new investors, new investment. Um, and I'm really keen to do whatever I can and whatever the NFF can um, to help with that because um, we, I think we can get there, but we've got to work together. And, and this initiative, um, I think, is a great one to demonstrate um, the people that are out there and the, and the new ways of thinking to get us to that $100 billion. So good job, Sam. I'm looking forward to the, the pitches as well. Thanks for having me, by the way. Pleasure. Thank you, Tony. Now, for those who are just arriving, um, my name is Sam Marwood, CEO and co-founder of Cultivate Farms. We're introducing the panel and we're about to get stuck into the seven farmers presenting, presenting their three-minute pitch. But uh, talking to the audience, I just want to outline who we believe is out there um, and the general categories you fit under. But we'd love you to jump on the chat now and just introduce yourself, maybe where you're from and maybe the angle you're interested in. Uh, um, so we have potential investors out there, uh, particularly people interested in investing in farmers in their local community. They're the people we really, really want to uncover, um, putting that power back into regional communities to bring and attract farmers to their communities. Retiring farmers, we know there's a few farmers out there who are keen on sharing ownership um, and they're coming along to see you know, what type of farmers are available for them to select from to, to look to share. There are plenty of aspiring farmers out there and you know, we have a massive audience of aspiring farm owners across the country. Uh, and we hope you get inspired from this and want to you know, develop your own investment proposal, jump on the next program, uh, but hopefully you'll be motivated to, to keep following your ownership dreams. And the last we know are regional community champions. So people out there who want to bring people back, keep people in the community, make their community vibrant, and they understand that farms and farm ownership is key to making that happen. So please jump on and, and just outline who you are and your interest, at least where you are. That'd be amazing to keep the discussion going and, and for us to connect with you as the audience. So I'll be emceeing the event and we're about to kick off. I just want to introduce two um, key people that uh, have helped to make this possible, in, including our farmers. But uh, one is Tam Marwood. Um, so Tam and I have been working for you know, a long time, months, years on, on the background of getting this all off the ground. And Tam and I just work away in the background, making sure everything's in place. But Tam will be managing the production today and has been key to getting this all off the ground. And the second is Adam Gibson. Adam is our, is our coach. Uh, and really enjoyed having Adam along the journey, <laughs> talking about tough love. He has given a lot of tough love uh, throughout this program, you know, the 10 week program we've had with the farmers uh, and you know, really uncovered, I think Adam's skill is figuring out what people aren't saying and trying to you know, tease out why they haven't done something. Why haven't they developed their summary pitch? Why haven't they uh, worked on their financial model? There's always something stopping people. And, and Adam's job has been to push people along so they get their pitch completed in, in time. And Adam, you know, I'd just love to hear some of your thoughts made around the program and what you've experienced coaching these farmers. Well, thanks, Sam. Uh, look, mate, it's just, I sort of echo what everyone's saying before. It's a real, I love this space. It's a real honor and a privilege to be involved with this program. Um, and I believe so wholeheartedly in what you guys as farmers are doing that this, it makes it a real pleasure to be involved with. Um, I, from, I guess I want to speak to the investors a little bit who are out there listening to this because what I know about the farmers here is that you guys are talented, passionate, um, experienced. You know, you've got so much skill and, and, and energy to bring to this space and experience to bring to it that you're just so investable as people. Um, and if you're an investor looking at this space now, you know, what, what greater, like I always say, the toilet, think things get tough when the toilet paper runs out, wait till the food runs out and see how important farmers are then. What better investment is there right now with long-term, just great capital growth, you've got great founders or good, good uh, business managers here as farmers. Um, and you've got an investment that literally can save the planet in terms of carbon and water and soil and, and, and our food system. So, you know, for a smart investor, this to me, this is a great space to be in um, for all the macro reasons, but also because we've got great, um, great business owners here as, fa as farmers. And, and I'm, I'm really proud to be associated with this today. Um, look forward to seeing you guys on your farms is a big part of it too. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Well, get ready uh, panel. Um, we're about to click play, but just a couple more house 
keeping. We are recording. Um, please do use the chat feature. People are putting in where they're from, which is great. Keep that going. Uh, just And also need to clarify that Cultivate Farms are providing factual information only uh, and not providing any financial product service. That's just a disclaimer I need to make. All right, so the structure is three minute video and then we'll have around 10 to 12 minutes of questions from the panel and hopefully a few from the audience. So our first farmers are Andy and Hayden White and we're hoping Hayden will be able to join us. He has been running around hectic, Andy has said, but hopefully he'll be able to join us in three minutes. If not, ha Andy is all over this. Uh, and uh, so let's click play, Tam, and uh, let's begin. We are Hayden and Andy White, and these are our four boys, Tom, James, Sam, and Max. We live and work on a large mixed broad acre cropping and livestock farm. And as a family, we all live and breathe farming. We are from Chokemole, New South Wales, just north of the Murray River, centrally located close to major centres and direct rail access to ports. We have a lifetime of farming experience, including 10 years of farm management. We share farm with neighbours and also own a small nearby farm. Hayden has a degree in agricultural science with honours and is a highly sought after property manager. However, he has reached a stage in his career where he would like the autonomy to achieve best practice outcomes of his own accord. Hayden has a reputation for having high standards in his work. He has proven records of producing high crop yields and exceptional animal husbandry. Hayden has industry experience and a natural ability to maximise profits without compromising long-term farm health. Andy is a director of a bookkeeping company and is highly regarded for helping other local farmers manage their books and maximise cash flow on farm. She also has a passion for the environment and has a degree in zoology and 10 years experience working with the land and water management plan. Our family are active in our local community by contributing to schools, sporting clubs and local businesses. We have a deep love and connection to the land and rural life. We are also well connected to a range of relevant industry contacts such as agronomists, stock agents and suppliers. Our vision is to have 600 hectares of our own with the option to expand in the future. We have a unique chance to secure this prime investment opportunity with your help. Our investment proposal is to purchase... Oh, is that paused? Yeah. A 1,500-acre property in Tokemore for $2,500 an acre. We have the necessary skills and knowledge to make a profit from this property and we know we can improve current farming practices using both regenerative and conventional practices. We already have one investor who is willing to back us and we ourselves have $250,000 to contribute to the property purchase. We are open to any investment offers to help us realise that vision and we are committed to long-term investment in the land. This is a unique investment opportunity to back a well-qualified, experienced and community-minded farming family that has a passion for keeping Australian agriculture alive and supporting the future of the industry. Our investment proposal will be rewarding on many levels as we have a vision that is very achievable and has social, economic and environmental benefits to investors. Properties in this region are selling quickly, so we need you on board to take advantage of this chance before it's too late. Our family is the enthusiastic face of future Australian agriculture. This dynamic opportunity is not to be missed. For more information, please contact us today. Well done, Andy and Hayden. Thank you. So over to the panel. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off. I'll pick um, somebody to kick off and let's start with Bert, if you're okay, Bert, and um, we'll go through. Sure. Well done, guys. You guys are quite the team. Um, I, uh, I just have one question in terms of that part of the world where you have seen asset values really increase. I mean, um, uh, I guess I just have a question around the 4% annual, annual lease fee, um, cause that 4% is against asset value. So, uh, I just want to have a bit of an understanding of, of, uh, moving forward. Do we have real confidence in our capacity to lock ourselves into a 4%, um, lease on an annual basis? Um, yeah, we do because we have to really. And um, Hayden and I both have got kind of um, steady jobs in the background as well, which we um, also kind of use in order to keep our living costs going, but then have the farm pay for the farm inputs and costs and things like that and return on itself. Um, obviously, the price of land has gone up and um, we're kind of banking on 
using the price of cattle and other commodities kind of increasing as well at the same time to be able to get those returns. So we, we have confidence that yes, we could make those returns, but obviously it's gonna be, it's gonna be tight going, it's gonna be tough going. So, but we think that we have the experience and the knowledge and the contacts to be able to, to achieve that. Excellent. And just, just a follow-up question quickly, how much time will the new farm take of, of yours and Hayden's? Like how much time will you guys be investing in running that new farm? Um, it will take, well, because it's 1,500 acres, it would probably take, I would say probably take um, a fair bit of time. That's why we've actually um, incorporated, we've got our four young up and coming <laughs> Cheap labour, <laughs> duck out and check the stock and, and things like that. But uh, we're also, uh, we have quite a lot of contacts of contact contractors and stuff like that in the, in the neighbourhood. So we have accounted for the fact that if we can't get jobs done, sewing done on time, contractors are right there, ready to go, just a phone call away. Excellent. Thank you. That's... We, have thought about, we have thought about those things. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's, it's good. It's a great... It's a great opportunity. Well done. And well done presenting what you've done. It's, it's good info. Thanks. Nigel, over to you. Congratulations, guys. It's, a, it's great to see your presentation. Great to see the family involvement and the, and the, and the young ones coming through. Obviously loving farming. Um, I, I was interested in uh, your thoughts around um, the regenerative uh, you mentioned regenerative uh, agriculture, sustainability and biodiversity a little bit and just uh, where you, uh, your ambitions were in that space. Yeah, well, we, that's kind of why we want to buy this farm is because we currently work for, we manage a farm and work for other people. So we would like to be able to go and do all the things that we've hoped and dreamed that we could do um, of our own accord with our own ideas and not just have to sit back and do what other people Think is a good idea and so we would really like to put more of these things into practice with you know putting in cover crops and doing other things like that that um you know uh and hayden is the one that should be talking more about this but unfortunately he's not here um and so we uh um want to put more of those practices into place that we can already see have merit and have value on our small block and but currently you know using the conventional come in and kind of pillage the ground like like other people are doing at the moment it's um you know we want to use our own knowledge and expertise in that area to to um to our own advantage on our place thank you uh tony um hi thanks uh thanks uh andy for the pitch um am i off mute yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry um Risk management. Can you just tell me a bit about uh, what sort of strategies you've got in terms of, you know, I mean, it's probably been a great, um, I'm careful when I say that, but good 12 months uh, last. How would you deal with, how are you dealing with and how have you identified the risks, I suppose, to the business? And because um, that's an integral part of the, the future and then obviously the return. Absolutely. Yes, it definitely is. Because I mean, I don't certainly don't want to, we've got four young children to feed. I don't want to end up, you know, living on the streets. Um, but we have got, obviously, uh, we share farm with other neighbours at the moment. Um, and we have, we have different avenues that we have got outlined and we pursue. So we've got uh, both got off farm income. And we've both, uh, and we also, um, have got stock and I mean water that we could sell coming in a pinch. We've got uh, our own little block of land. So if things went pear shaped, we could also sell that off if we needed to um, and things like that. And, and just to be able to, and we've diversify cattle, sheep, different types of crops, you know, having irrigated and dry land, things like that. So we are mitigating our risk by not just having like a monoculture of one commodity so um, in that regard, that's um, our risk management, I guess, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Tough. Will, over to you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks, Andy. And what well I'm for um, struggling along by yourself, uh, Matt Short and Notice. My, my question was again, linked to the risk question and any of the modeling that you may have done. So, so what would be the biggest risk if there was a particular commodity to come off? And I suppose I'm thinking in particular about some of your red meat sectors that are at a you know, all-time historic highs. 
uh, it was good to hear that you've got some current stock now, but how much do you need to buy in to make the 600 hectares work? Um, and how far or how, how much back towards a longer term average could your business model survive? And then finally, as you mentioned a couple of times, as a, as a get out of, uh, you know, as a, as a base um, risk mitigant as your current um, paid employment that you have, how supportive are your current employers with this venture? We actually get along famously with our current employers. And um, yeah, they, they are very supportive of our, um, of our operation so far. And um, we actually, yeah, the, in terms of um, how much we can get done, like we all go out at, at the moment on the weekends and go and farm our little block and, you know, the kids get out there and, and that's kind of, it's kind of almost like family time that we have together. That we go on, we, we don't go playing footy or going, you know, we don't have a speedboat, we go on the weekends, we all go farming together and stuff like that. So, and that's a part of why we want to do this is to, to go and do our own thing and grow ourselves and have something for the kids in the future. Um, but in terms of mitigating risk, it, I mean, it's, it's huge. That's why, you know, not everyone goes out, um, you know, buying farms. It is a massive risk, um, but we have thought about it very hard. And our modeling does kind of cover. Um, I'm a bookkeeper, so I've kind of I do cash flow forecasts for a living, and I certainly don't want to embark on anything that is going to make us make it not dip into the red. You know, I'm very much all about positive cash flow, and uh, we've forecasted with very conservative figures, so lower than anticipated income as a steady average income, as opposed to the sky high figures. We've got um, things like to get more stock on board, um, investigating with Stock Co to get finance for stock and things like that to kind of try and ride out the wave of the current high cattle prices and and things like that and locking in different contracts for things when times are good so that we can mitigate if the price goes down and, and purchasing water when it's cheap and all that kind of stuff. So we've thought about a lot of different scenarios um, as that time goes on. Sorry, Will, I've forgotten about the first part of your question. <laughs> Did I answer all your questions? <laughs> no, I think you have. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah. Well done, Andy. Uh, well done. Unfortunately, Hayden's just sent me a message. He's kicking himself that he, he's, he's not far away, but he's actually been breaking his neck to get here. So that's, that's a part of the reason that we, you know, are so desperate to, to kind of get into this is because he's out doing things for other people he doesn't necessarily want to be doing but uh, wants to have his own farm doing it his own way. And um, so, but he has a job, so that's good. This is the balance. And this is the, that's yeah. what we went through this, the whole program. People have got kids, you know, balancing life and um, your dreams are big and um, everyone's been carving time as they can to make this happen. And that's just realities. It's, um, you've got to, you know, make an, an, a living and, and plan for your future. And I think the, uh, everyone on the program has been amazing at, at making that balance happen and carving out time. So Andy and Hayden, well done. Uh, we will move on to the next one. And um, thank you, Sam. Thanks thank everybody. You. And the uh, audience, please do send through uh, uh, questions as they pop up as well. Uh, but Tam, let's move on to Mel Brown. Would you like to support an aspiring young farmer building a new model for dairy production that's local, ethical, and based on best practice land management? I'm Melanie Brown. I'm an experienced goat herder, cheese maker, and regenerative soil consultant living in Dalesford, a busy tourism region in central Victoria. I'm looking to commercialize my goat micro dairy to provide goat's milk, yogurt, and cheese to the community via farmers markets, specialty grocers, restaurants, and a weekly order system for local customers. I'm part of a community of passionate small-scale farmers and foodies who are keen to stand behind me in my enterprise. At the moment, the dairy industry is characterized by a high barrier to entry for new farmers, centralized distribution systems and their associated carbon miles, low milk prices, and animal welfare concerns around the practice of slaughtering kids or calves within 24 hours of birth. My business represents a new model for localised dairy with some key points of difference. I'll be using a mobile milking parlour that allows me to milk the goats wherever they are at in the paddock. This means I can practice truly regenerative rotational grazing without creating what the industry calls sacrifice paddocks, which are areas of the farm that over time become compacted and unusable due to repeated animal foot traffic back to the milking parlour. 
I'll also be leveraging the unique ability of goats to thrive on a wide range of perennial species, meaning I can establish a grazing and fodder system that is biodiverse and drought resilient. Using both of these factors, I'll be focusing on building soil carbon and increasing species diversity on the farm. I'll be milking 50 Anglo-Nubian does, which are a beautiful heritage breed, and I'll also be keeping the goat kids with their mothers until they're old enough to be weaned. Unlike conventional dairies in Australia where they are separated at birth and often slaughtered soon after. I'll be working alongside other local young farmers to stack my enterprise in a cooperative land share arrangement that will provide increased market access, as well as the benefits of shared infrastructure and resources. My model is designed to tap into the huge demand for local produce in this region, while also creating a flexible dairy prototype that can be expanded and used by other aspiring young dairy farmers. The total investment required is $200,000 for the business infrastructure, including the dairy factory and mobile milking parlor. I'll be contributing $50,000, so I'm seeking a further $150,000 investment to get up and running. The projected average return on investment is 10%. I've surveyed local businesses and potential customer groups and received a hugely positive response, so the market is ready to go. Please get in touch if you'd like to know more. Well done, Melanie. All right, well, I'll mix up the uh, responses. I'll, we'll start with Tony, if you're okay to jump in, Tony. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mel. Great story. Um, I've got a few questions, but I'll only ask one. Um, the 50 goats, uh, so will you be milking them all of your own? Have you got staff? And in terms of the marketing, I, I, you noted the market access and local, uh, I assume, outlets around Dalesford um, supplying those. So will you be doing all of that? And where's the mix, I suppose, on farm and post farm? Because I suppose they're both pretty big jobs. Yes, so uh, within my budget, I have uh, just got an employee three days a week to help me out. So I'll be full time. Um, yeah, I'll have a part time employee to help out both with milking and with distribution. Um, and then, I, yeah, my partner also will be involved part time. Hey, Can Melanie. I just ask another, oh, sorry, I just for the cheese making, you know, um, the facilities for cheese making, is that all included in the 200K? Yes, yeah, all included. Yep. Hey, Mel, can you just move your microphone maybe closer to your mouth on your headphones? Or... Let me put my headphones in. That might be better. But I think we got that response. Tony, you're more than welcome to go for a second question out of uh, if you've got a list. Okay, we'll come back around. All right, I think I interpreted that. Will, let's go to you. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Thanks for the for the presentation. I had a question on the animal welfare aspects of your business plan, which is clearly going to be a, a key pillar of your marketing and, and go to market. Will you be seeking formal accreditation somehow? And how are you sort of going to be able to demonstrate to the market that, that you can walk the talk, so to speak? And then second one, what, what will you do with the kids once they reach weaning age? Is that, uh, and how much of the cash flow is going to be generated from them or how much you're going to retain in the herd? Sure, okay. So in terms of accreditation, um, that's actually a really good idea and something that I haven't looked into. I, I think what I was um, basing that on is just having a really open structure in terms of the business. So, you know, open for farm tours and farm walks um, and, you know, being the person at the farmer's market and communicating what I'm doing to a local customer base to build up that trust and rapport um, within the community. Um, and so once they reach weaning age, uh, so some of them obviously will be retained as future breeding stock within the herd if they're female. The males will uh, be raised from meat, so I'll probably slaughter at around six months of age. Oh, is that, that it, Will? Um, we will go back around if needed. Uh, let's go, uh, Nigel. Oh, you're on mute, mate. Got you now. Well done, Mel. That's um, it's really, really interesting, uh, and um, and it's a it's a real growth area, the goat's cheese um area. So it'll be exciting to to be to be going down that pathway. Um, so is your ask in addition to the money to find land to lease? It, just as a first question, or or is I it? Getting... Am I still looking for land? Yeah. To lease? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so uh, I've been working over the past sort of year and a half 
with um, with my community and talking to a number of different people with land available in this area. Um, so in a, in a way, yes, I'm still looking for the perfect opportunity, um, but there are, uh, there are options available to me and it's about for me forming the right relationship um, with somebody who understands what I'm doing and is happy to have me there longer term. Um, so yes, still open to options, but I do, um, yeah, I'm having a number of conversations already. So I'm confident in my ability to find so much lease. So, so the investment sort of contingent on you finding land to lease to, to grow your model? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and um, we, we've, one, of the, one of the investments we've got is uh, with, with a, a, um, a young farmer that does sell through the markets and we've found that to be a really successful method of building your brand and business. Have you visited a lot of markets and, and understand the whole system pretty well? Yeah, yes, I have. So I've spoken to a number of market coordinators in this region about whether they would uh, be looking for another uh, dairy provider. And there, there is huge demand. There's only, like, there's only one cheese maker in this region that sells at markets. Um, so they are looking for more of them. Um, and, yeah, the markets obviously are a fantastic opportunity in this region because there's so many of them and because there's so many tourists that come out to them every weekend. Okay. And and to come up with your return uh, forecast, you've built a financial model. Have you built a financial model that investors can look at? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've got a financial model. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good ones. And Mel, I think your microphone has played up on us a little bit, but we can still hear you. So I think we'll, we'll keep working, working through. Bert, your, your questions. Thanks, Mel. Well, that's really an adventure, and you're in the right part of the world to be doing this. Um, just to follow on from Nigel, can you just share a bit of insight into when this venture, based on your financial model, when it gets into positive cash flow, and also just give us a bit of an understanding of the revenue lines in terms of what's what sort of surplus goat sales and then what is cheese and, and it, all the different lines you have within your revenue stack? Yeah, sure. Is that better in terms of sound? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, positive cash flow in my model is between two and a half and three years into the business. Um, in terms of financial modeling, so 50% of revenue at the moment is in cheese um, and then around 20% in yogurt and 20% in milk um, and then the, the rest in the sale of kids or like, so breeding stock or goats for meat. Excellent. Thank you. Tony, did you have those follow-up questions? Do you want to jump back yeah, in or anyone else? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, Mel, I'm interested in the, um, obviously, your, your product or your business um, relies heavily on, on consumer, you know, face-to-face -face consumer, whether it's markets or anything else, and the whole food safety aspect. Um, I feel like that's a... a um, not so much a risk and not always looking at the negatives, but I mean, can you talk me through how you're sort of approaching that? The, um, and I was saying before the infrastructure, just interested in, you know, um, what, how you would maintain that really high quality food safety aspect that's just so important. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So at the moment, I'm working one day a week as a relief milker um, for Cellar Dairy, which is um, the dairy that I think I mentioned, maybe that is um, the the first licensor in Australia of this mobile milking parlour. Um, so they already are licensed and accredited dairy. So through working there, I'm learning um, everything that they have to offer in terms of food safety. And Tess from Cellar Dairy trained for 10 years um, with another, another goat dairy in the region um, who are champions of, of food safety in the dairy industry. So uh, Dairy Safe Victoria work with that dairy specifically to help educate other dairy farmers um, in food safety. So I feel well supported by other members of the industry in this region um, who have the experience and knowledge and are happy to share and sort of mentor me along the way in that aspect. Mm -hmm. Got time for any more, Sam, or not? We, we are. We're doing very well. So throw, throw um, in it Just the, the branding, Mel. Um, where do you see yourself in the, you know, I imagine it's a bit of a, a lovely spot, Darsford, but um, lots of sort of boutique food uh, places where do you see yourself as you know premium sort of I suppose it's all reasonably premium but talk me through how you would brand the product I suppose yeah sure yeah that's a really interesting one um 
while I, I want to take advantage of the opportunity to brand as, you know, as a premium product in this region because it's there, I'm more passionate about providing an accessible grocery item for people mm -hmm. in this region. Um, so I'd love the core of my business model to be a CSA membership. So, de you know, delivering or de dropping off to a centralized hub um, weekly for local customers to pick up um, and then sort of providing mid-range, you know, market produce that tourists can, can come and sample from. But the, I guess the beauty of cheese is that um, depending on surpluses or deficiencies in your milk supply, you can prepare a number of different products. So um, at times of the year when I had more milk, I could set aside some more premium aged cheeses um, and then sell them to markets or to restaurants um, to sort of, you know, diversify my cash flow that way. Excellent, thank you. Melanie, we have one from Adam. Um, hi Mel, well done. Hey, um, there's obvious to me. There's an obvious uh, opportunity to scale this or replicate it as a as a potentially you know, disruptive model for small scale dairy production. Um, to what degree? You know, so we could replicate that all over the country potentially. Is why I keep seeing it. Yeah. Um, to what degree? Did you, a do you have plans for that? And B, what? would an investor's interest in that be? Would they be buying into the opportunity to be part of that as well? Or is it separate? Or could you just talk us through that aspect? Please. Yeah, that's also something that I think about and I'm really excited about. Um, what's exciting for me is that me setting up this business is kind of the second iteration of it, building on the seller dairy model. Um, and all of the, uh, the plans basically for the infrastructure is open source. So it's been developed by Oliver Holm Holmgren and he's happy to share it with anybody, basically, as he said, to help sort of disrupt the dairy model and provide more people with the opportunity to get into dairy. So from an investor's point of view, what you're buying into um, is not necessarily intellectual property, but if, you know, proof over time of a working model um, based on a set amount of investment and with some really great documentation around systems that could be really easily replicated um, and I would be really keen to jump on board with that sort of as a as a mentor so you know there's opportunity to train up other people looking to use that model and um, and replicate it that way thanks yeah. I'll take one more question if um, Will or Nigel or Bert Sam I've got a question um, I'd just like to understand a bit more, Mel, around the, um, the infrastructure that you'd be looking to purchase, the, the piece of kit. Can you talk us through how many, like have, have those bits of kit been uh, designed and manufactured over a long period of time? Has there been a lot of those come through the system and is there any risk in that uh, development of that, that bit of kit? Mm. Um, so in terms of the portable milking parlour, it's actually a really common piece of equipment used in Europe. And um, so where, you know, they traditionally run smaller dairy herds and more of this kind of artisanal style of dairy. Um, Seller Dairy, who I'm working with, are the first people to license one in Australia. So it is so new and innovative in this area, but based on, you know, a tradition and a model from other countries. Um, in terms of the, the milk factory or the processing facility, um, that also is a little bit innovative in that it's small scale and movable, but there are a number of small, small scale dairies in Victoria and in wider Australia with similar models that are doing well. Okay, thanks. Well, I saw you were off mute. I did, if we can squeeze in one, one more. Mel, sort of half, half comment, half question. It would appear that your business model is very much that artisanal, highest environmental and animal welfare standards um, and I suppose the question is, are you taking the fullest advantage of that if you're not planning to have your own branded product? And are you leaving some of the potential premium on the table by not doing that um, from a branding perspective? So that was a, a question, I suppose, there. Um, so I, I would have my own brand of product. Right. Um, I yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm being, I guess, being mentored by Seller Dairy, but I won't be branding underneath them. I'll be an independent. Right. Okay, I misunderstood that. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> Melanie, well done. Uh, great questions, uh, well answered, um, but uh, and love the story. Uh, I will move on to the next farmers, but I just want to throw out to the audience: please do send in comments, send in questions. We want you to work, not just sitting there and uh, enjoying, but uh, participate as well. It'll be amazing. We'll throw some questions that you put in. Uh, let's go to our next farmers uh, on our order, which is Jesse and Trent Davis. Here we go. Hi, we're 
Jesse and Trent Davis, who are broad acre food producers from Narrambeen, Western Australia, and our business is Fairview Food Ag Investments. Together with Jesse's parents, we co manage Fairview Farm, their fourth generation family farming operation, which has both a successful cereal cropping and grass fed prime lamb enterprise based on ASP certified farming systems. ASP certified is the only ACCC accredited regenerative farming system in Australia. These farming practices were started in the early 2000s by progressive farmers who are passionate about soil health, plant health and animal health. In 2019 at crop updates, we were presented with this graph outlining the steady population decline of Australian farm. In 2019, there were 3,500 farming businesses and the experts on the day predicted that in 2050, there could be as little as 500 grain producers left in the state. That is only 500 businesses managing all of WA grain production land. Utilising our regenerative farming practices and business skills, we are driven to be part of that 500. We seek investment partners to help us grow our ASB certified regenerative farming business through the purchase of 4,000 hectares of local farms for an investment of $4 million. Narrambeen is a highly sought after broadacre grain and sheep producing area. Neighbouring towns have seen a recent price surge and we believe the Narrambeen area presents a significant capital growth opportunity preceding similar price surges. We have identified four suitable farms in Narrambeen that have a good mixture of soil types, water sources and conservation land. The total land investment of $4 million is achieved from a 10% personal investment from Trent and Jesse of $400,000. A 60% contribution from investors of $2.4 million and the remaining 30% will be financed through a combination of bank and government loans of $1.2 million. In the future, we aim to purchase more farms, engage with more like-minded farmers and continue to build a successful and diverse farming operation across WA. To be a successful and diversified business in 2050, we plan to grow our farming operation. We seek like-minded investors to join us in our journey. We are excited to engage with people who are passionate about healthy food production and healthy communities. For more information, please contact us at Fairview Food Ag Investments. Well done, Jesse and Trent. I'm so impressed at how much information we're able to get into these pictures and just another great example uh, of that. So, Will, you finish off the last one. We'll get you to start this one. Sure. Thanks, Sam. Uh, hi, Trent. Jesse, thanks for the, for the pitch. And great to see you referencing the Rural Bank Farmland Index there in one of your slides. It's uh, very, very nice to see that. Um, my question is the, the returns that you're expecting your investors to receive and the split between capital um, and, and the profit generation from, from the business and, and how you've been forecasting that. Sure, thanks, Will. And we must say we absolutely loved working with Greg, our Rural Bank mentor. He was fantastic and always gave us lots of tricky questions throughout to make sure every facet of the business will hopefully come yeah. together. Uh, so our return on investment uh, for our investors is a 3% dividend per annum. And then at the end of the 10 year period, the capital growth opportunity as well. As a buyback. Yeah. As, as a buyback. Yeah. Company, yeah company. So at the end of the 10 years, Trent and I will aim to purchase the rest of the farm or purchase, buy out the investors, and then refinance with our um, bank partners. Um, yeah. And during that time, we will lease the farm to our existing farm business that we farm with my parents. So there's always that opportunity for lease income throughout the period for us to meet that return on investment or the dividend to the investors. So the, um, yeah, that, that dividend will, the income will actually be getting paid from a lease from an existing um, proven farming enterprise. Yep, right. And, and um, if I can just ask one more, Sam, the, the, the wheat belt of WA, um, they have fantastic seasons, two out of every three. You do have the occasional, you know, proper drought over there. 
Um, have you modelled out, you know, in worst case scenario, we come into two consecutive years of drought, how does that impact your model? Um, you know, I'm sure you'd have the ability to probably weather that towards the end of the 10-year investment horizon would be greater at the start. So, so if it did happen in these first two years, how would you approach that? It's probably a two-step approach we've considered there, and uh, this is perhaps splitting our investment, so purchasing half of the land up front and half in a, another time period so there's less strain on our business, or potentially buying it all up front and leasing to other parties um, because the lease rates around here are very competitive. It's always hard to get lease land and good lease land. So that's two opportunities that the investor will still be able to make an income. But also the soil types and water infrastructure we're looking for should help to reduce the risk of drought on the business. Uh, so we're looking for different soil types to what we're currently farming and also access to scheme water, good dams, good um, catchments. Trent's dad's actually a bulldozing contractor, so we'll get John up and make sure he is looking after us too. Yeah, one of the, the my, one of the reasons, main reasons we're looking to for for this expansion is um, is so we can mitigate against that. We're we're looking to um, or diverse, diversify our soil types and and also access to water as well. So um, yeah, in the the soil types that have um, uh, different different. Um, in, in good different seasons, they have the advantages and disadvantages. Um, so we're looking to d diversify our soil types through this expansion and hopefully mitigate a bit of that variance in the through the seasons as well. Great. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank you, Will. Uh, next, we'll go to Nigel. Uh, great presentation, guys. Um, just a, a first question. Question. Excuse my ignorance, where exactly is Narrabeen? So Narrabeen is in the central wheat belt of Western Australia. I think the video was a little glitchy. So we're <laughs> yeah. about uh, 380 kilometres east of Perth. Right, I know where you are. Yep. Low rainfall zone. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how long have you guys been working with the ASP model? Uh, we've been with them for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and really getting stronger and stronger in the last eight, probably. It's a really great group of farmers. We're so lucky to have found them throughout our journey, and I've really enjoyed meeting everyone through ASP. Yeah, no, they are a good group. We've, we've worked a lot with them over the, over the last few years as well. Um, so the, uh, uh, it's, if it's a 3% lease effectively supported by the greater family business, is that, is that the right understanding? So no, well, no. kind of. In a twofold, the lease will probably be a higher percentage to the farming business. So Trent and I will be gaining a percentage. That's our share farm with my parents. Right. So we'll be putting our percent towards putting uh, buying out the um, investors in ten years' time. Okay. And have you guys worked on a model for the buyback that you're looking for? Yes. We have. Yeah, we have worked on a um year in year out buyback um using using that um using that model um yeah we, in which we can go back and revisit with um with interested investors and and we can we can change that around to suit to suit um different parties needs and what what are you mainly going to be cropping is it wheat there yeah mainly uh cereals and livestock so we have on our current farm 70% cereals and 30% livestock. Of that 30%, we generally will improve half of that every year by perhaps using a clover or a tillage radish. So we're continually improving that pasture as well. And we're hoping with the additional land, we're going to move it back to maybe 60-40 to de-risk the business a bit more and make sure we're looking after those soils in their break year. And giving them the best opportunity to be mm -hmm. successful long term. But part of that ASP model is, um, yeah, it's working with that your rotations as well. And what the extra expansion, the extra land will afford us is that um, we will be able to go to a, a, a more towards a more even um, split yeah. with the cropping and livestock. Um, just because, yeah, yeah, with the 
the cropping, like with the holding we have now, we're more reliant on the cropping income, whereas with an expansion, it's viable to, to go towards that more even split. And, and I think you mentioned you, you'd identified a few properties. Is, have you got a one that you think's a good chance that you like? Or? Yeah, so there's two properties uh, out of the four that are already leased and have previously been advertised. So we will be looking at them. We have been working closely with the real estate agents that were involved in those properties. And with the backing of investors, we have two other properties that we'd like to target because we think they bring great diversity to our business. Thank you. Great questions, Nigel. I'll throw now to Tony. Hey, Trent and Jesse, thanks so much for the presentation. Loved it. Um, I got a question about the Regen Ag and um, the properties that you've identified and how uh, applicable or how much of a step up in terms of your existing sort of management um, that it would take to not so much convert if that's um, but you know really fully uptake the ASP model and um, and secondary to that do you see that there's either a premium, obviously there's an ongoing um, wellness factor or sustainability factor around, um, you know, what, what might be called Regen Ag. Um, so do you see that sort of a, a, an essential part of the business? If you've got a property that perhaps took a whole lot more work to, you know, embed the Regen practices in it, where would that suit, where would that, how would that impact on the business plan? Yeah. Uh, so part of what we've modelled is in year one, we'd like to do exten extensive core sampling across all of the properties. So that's a metre deep core sample across uh, what's every four hectares. So it's very extensive and we do that within our own business now. But what that does is mean it gives you a plan and guidance as to what exact variable rates you should be applying to improve the soils in the shortest amount of time that you can. Um, but also helps you set a plan to make it uh, more profitable in the long term without wasting any inputs. And that's something ASP is very big on, is not wasting inputs because uh, your synthetics, they're expensive to get here. Um, out in the wheat belt, it costs just as much to get them on the truck, landed on your farm as it does the product. So we're very cautious about, um, about what we're applying. And also we will target the paddocks you could probably more quickly apply and um, turn into regenerative type system. The ASP certified yeah, can actually put a paddock in or out of your overall production um, as it needs, as you're fixing it and turning it into the property or the paddock that you'd like it to be so it fits your system. So I hope that answers your question, Tony. Yeah. I yeah uh, about it being integral long-term for the business. We see it has a really good fit for our business because we would like to be here for a long time uh, and we would like to pass on better dirt to our future generations, whether it be our family or some aspiring farmers down the track. So we really hope that our, our practices will result in better land management and better land. Yep. Excellent, thanks. I think, I think that um, the production is actually comparable um, anyway, Tony, is that right? Yeah. So the, the production costs of the our, our systems is it's it's not a huge um, price differential price difference from conventional. And so so what you're saying to convert, obviously it's going to take the time to build the build it to where we would like it to be. But apart from yeah, but the the um, the system and the price is reasonably comparable and. Um, uh, yeah, apart from the addition of the say the soil, additional soil testing to actually recognise what we, we where we need to target. Mm. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Bert, I think um, Jesse and Trent have been waiting for a really curly question. Have you got one for them? Uh, oh, my curly question is where'd you get that uniform? I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm the uniform um, lady, Bert. <laughs> uh, well done. Well, they're looking very sharp. I guess um, you guys have got big aspirations and well done for dreaming big because I think that's fantastic. I'd like to understand how you've thought about the fact that your new partners in future will be investors and they will have, um, they'll be requiring different disciplines than what you probably work towards at the moment. So how do you feel about and what sort of things would you implement 
because you're going to end up semi-corporatized. So can you talk us through how you would go about that? Do you want me to? Oh. Um, we're already starting to do that. So probably uh, 12 months ago, we started looking at the family corporate model. So we're really um, building up towards that. And we had a great succession planning session with AgriWeb last year, and they had some really good systems as to how you would do that. There are a few corporates around here, so we could model what we'd like to do from them. And also Trent's got really good experience in running his own um, plumbing business, which you can talk about his systems. Yeah, oh, well, what I would like to say is, um, so coming with the, the current business structure we're in, so there's actually, there's already two two families running it. So it's Jess and I and Jesse's, um, Jesse's parents, they, um, who, who are the landholders and yeah as part of that um succession we've come into the business and and it has we are we've began to set it up as a family corporate structure so we're having those having those meetings setting the uh, setting an agenda and and trying to achieve those objectives to keep to keep all parties happy and i suppose with investors um so we'll obviously still run that as the as the managing party but we'll be able to address anything um, or, or try to address uh, any of the investors' um, uh, objectives and, and issues or um, and just keep that, obviously, that's just the way that, um, yeah, the communication between the, the management and the investors will be able to, um, yeah, we'll keep that standard up. I think the other thing to note there is uh, mining's a massive, uh, Western Australia is a massive mining state. So there's been more and more safety coming in through uh, the mining influence throughout farms. Our CBH, which is our grain system, you must wear high vis to deliver to CBH. So you're seeing during peak periods, more and more people are already starting to implement it. But what we will be needing to do and what we're planning to do is to implement proper safety procedures for nearly every scenario on farm. And we welcome more impact uh, input into that too. I think there's a lot we could learn in that area. Mm. Okay, great. So I just have one quick other follow-up question. You touched on WA, you know, with the influence of the mining sector and whatnot. And I know labor has been a real challenge in that part of the world. Can you talk us through as you scale up, how you're going to address and, and meet your labor requirements in that part of the world? Mm. Um, I, yeah, well, I'd just like to say there's still, a, like obviously through, um, you can recognize through um, this group today, that um, we, we kind of want to um, target um, the people we'd like to get involved. And it's kind of like-minded um, like minded people coming through. Like Jess and I met at um, studying agribusiness at um, USC University in WA. Um, and through that, we've just, uh, and through different community projects we've been involved in, and Jessie, she's, uh, she's the director of WA Farmers and um, has just a large network within the ag industry. Um, and so I really recognise just through our network and just being able to target actually the people who are really interested in in um, in building a career in ag and not so much the the transient um, workforce that um, might want to drive a tractor but um, get a higher paid job driving a truck on a mine a year later. Mm -hmm. So um, we're looking for more people who are who are um, passionate and committed to the industry. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Yeah, well done, Jesse and Trent. We'll pull it up there and move on. But we will stay in WA. Um, but before we do that, thank you. There's a couple of questions coming through. Just remember to click to panellists and attendees. Carolyn has a great comment in there. Uh, and James McGill, I see your question. We'll do that at the end, I think. Um, but let's stay in WA. Uh, we are now going to Catherine and Andy Benton. G'day, we are Andy and Catherine Benton, and this is our daughter, Scarlett. We have the opportunity to share farm, a 2,320 hectare property, 57 kilometres out of Jerramunga, Western Australia. Warabilla, named after an Aboriginal word for far away west, was developed by Tom Atterby OAM. The property epitomises the best farming practices during his era. It has since changed hands and circumstances have led to us securing a 10 year share farm agreement with the current owners of Warabilla. We are looking for investors to help us set up the grass-fed beef side of the operation. 
We are looking for a minimum of $600,000 for the purchase of 200 head of pre-tested in-calf cows to get us started. Though an investment of $1.5 million for 500 head of PTIC cows would ideally suit the current farm carrying capacity. We're looking for investors to work with us for the next seven to 10 years with the investment returning either better than 4.2 per annum return of investment over the seven year or 6% per annum return on investment over the 10 year term due to the sliding scale of returns we're proposing. I have been involved in farming for most of my life and have followed my father's footsteps into regenerative agriculture, as it is now called. I was 20 when I took over management of my family's farm before leaving after the accession plan failed. Along the way, I've worked in diverse roles, locations and farm types and learned a lot about this style of farming. Many years, courses and seminars later, I feel I am ready to take on this challenge of producing grass-fed beef regeneratively. I got involved in farming when I came to Australia in 2006. Since then, I have attended workshops, seminars and courses on regen farming. I have assisted Andy when he was managing various farming operations, getting involved hands-on as well as with research and book work. Having grown up in Germany without a farming background, I feel I can bring an open mind and fresh eyes to the enterprise. The cattle and the entire farm will be run in a regenerative manner using holistic planning and proven regenerative grazing techniques. These practices will return biodiversity to the landscape, kickstart the water cycle, sequester atmospheric carbon into the soil, as well as improving farm and soil fertility. Off the back of this, we will be producing nutrient-dense food to sell to the expanding grass-fed and the niche regenerative agriculture markets. Research has shown grass-fed meat is far more nutritious than grain-fed, and with the increased soil nutrient availability, regenerative grass-fed is even more so. Demand continues to grow in both domestic and overseas markets for clean, nutrient-dense food to feed growing health-conscious populations. Once we have completed 10 years of Mora Villa, we will be looking to invest into our own farm to continue regenerative agriculture and to pass it on to the next generation. Well done, Catherine and Andy. I just love the uh, the variation we have across, you know, not only Australia, but the different uh, investment opportunities required. So here's a little bit of a different one where they've got the land, but they want support with the business. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Bert, I'm going to kick off with you. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, guys. Um, <clears throat> a bit of a different one. I've, I've really only got two questions. And I think the first one is around how we manage the risk of um, getting into the livestock markets, knowing that we're, we're, we're pretty full at the moment in terms of livestock values and how you would manage that risk moving forward when you're purchasing the livestock. And also, I want, I'd like to understand if, if there's any other security behind the investment besides livestock. Is there anything that underpins it? Thanks. Um, I suppose the investment itself, we intend to have the, um, the herd insured, um, so to secure the investment. Um, I suppose that answers that last question. There's nothing, nothing else in, in terms of security for, for the investment that term. Yeah, so the, the way we're looking at the property, 2,320 hectares is quite a big chunk of land. So with the stocking rate that we're looking at, um, we have lots of room to go. So um, I guess in terms of food and water, um, it should be covered, I guess, in that regard. Um, yeah, is, is there something specific that you're... That you're I, I, in these circumstances, I've just seen them secured by, by a, um, a second mortgage or another mortgage over some land. So I'm just wondering if you'd taken any of that into consideration. No, we're looking into... Oh, we've got um, basically info about uh, insurance. So we're covering everything we can from lightning strike fire, theft. But there is no, no, but there no. is there, We have a share farm agreement. We don't own any land and we have no assets in that sort of um, space to provide any other security. We feel that if we insure to the full value of the investment, it should basically protect the investment, the investor from any, any loss. Yeah. Great. And so, um, and so how are you thinking about in your procurement of the livestock, how you might manage that when you're going to, the timing getting into the market and, and maintaining that value so that we know that, you know, depending on 
on the time frames that they can depreciate in value. So how, how do you sort of go about that in your procurement plan? So a procurement plan, I'll get it there eventually, um, has been to get the most cost-effective um, animals we can get. Currently, we're looking at well-bred um, drought masters and breeding back to, um, to boss taurus bloodlines and uh, introducing things like Wagyu into to increase the... Um, the niche, basically. Well, even. So just to, have, just to make sure that there's a bigger range of... Um, or bigger market, I guess, that can take a... Bigger margin. Bigger margins in, in the, um, the saleability. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we're going to run it so that whatever we buy in will be the most cost-effective we can find. So not buying at the top of the market and then the prices start depreciating and we're... We've got cattle that aren't worth the money. Yeah, the other thing, I guess, they are preg tested in calves. So hopefully by having a calf at the end of the, the breeding, hopefully there will be value literally dropped onto the ground, hopefully. So, yeah. Yeah, so that, that speeds up that cash flow. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No worries. Thanks, Bert. Nigel? Well done, guys. Really interesting to, to look at that proposition. Um, I was curious as to who you think your um, where your market is for your grain fed produce. Where do you think you'll be selling? Grass fed. The grass fed, I mean, sorry, yeah. I, we intend to actually develop markets um, locally. Uh, there's a there is a quite a decent market um, locally for well, locally as in. The southwest. It's a quite a health conscious area down here. So at the moment, we're living a bit further away from the farm, which is about uh, 200, 200 kilometers away. And this is an incredibly health conscious area. Um, so with the markets, I guess we're looking into, yeah, the regen egg, grass fed, healthy part. Um, I guess at the start, it'll just go through the normal route, but we're hoping to build and um, maybe attend markets and things like that. So because we're already in this area, we know the markets quite well and the people that would be definitely interested in this kind of thing. We run our modeling actually as if there was no available markets, um, as in as if we were selling straight through like every other farmer. But we really intend to actually get out there. We know a few butchers already who would be willing to take grass fed. Um, like just as an example, there's one literally that is just taking grass fed only. They don't have any yes. other um, produce at all. So they, they would definitely be a taker. And these are the, these are the markets we would be chasing. chasing pretty hard. Yeah, no, I'd definitely recommend you work out the markets for yourselves to see if you can increase your margin and help yourself through the riskier parts of, uh, of the agricultural um, uh, cycles. Mm. Definitely, definitely. That's good, let's go. Will. Thanks guys. Um, I, I had similar questions. I understand that the insurance there to cover the initial risk of the initial purchase price. What I would like to sort of hear is the assumptions around that the price that you're able to receive for, for the product you're turning off um, and the insurance obviously won't cover that. So, so red meat prices are at historical highs um, and there are, you know, we don't have to look too far in the past. We've had various prolonged periods where red meat prices were far more depressed than they are now. So I suppose uh, uh, any comments of, um, you can make on, on the assumptions you've used with your forward cash flows on, on red meat prices? Yeah, I guess um, yeah. I'm sort of the, the pessimist, I guess. Um, so I went and calculated on not only 10% loss of cows, but also 10% less of calves. And my base rate, as, as in by the time we're selling, is only set at $1,000 a head, um, which currently I think the last, at, yeah, oh, the last sales it was $1,500. So I went with very, I guess, very bad figures um, and obviously the hope that it wouldn't drop under that. Um, and we still can make it work. Um, obviously, if there's an increase or it stays at $1,500 by the time we're getting around to obviously selling our offspring, um, it's just going to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right and center. But yeah, so we we did use the, the worst scenario basically. And we also did buy in at the most expensive. So mm -hmm. we were estimating three thousand three thousand dollars a head for PTIC cows and then selling at a thousand um, yeah. for the offspring just to really load it 
in the worst way possible. Yeah, great. And then the impact, you sort of had two levels there, fully subscribed at $1.5 million to get 500 braiders, but you could you could make the model work at 200. Just how will that impact investor returns if you aren't successful in getting the full subscription? And does it mean that you're, in effect, leasing too much land? If you, you know, How long would it take you to get to your optimum stocking rate? Um, 200, so, 200 gets us started to be able to basically move ourselves onto the farm and kickstart this business. Basically, um, that, that, that's the floor of it being not being equitable for us. Yeah. Um, the, re, the way we've geared it is that we intend to have returns set on the investment, not on our, our not um, on the sales, not on the sales of our livestock, not on it's not a percentage of how what we produce. We want to basically return the return on investment being set to what's been invested. Um, so there's a there's a definite definite return for the investor um, on those years, basically, yeah. regardless of how much we're selling them for. Um, I guess that is one way we looked at it. I guess it, it, it would be an option, I guess, of changing that depending on what the investor would like. Um, but that way, we thought it's guaranteeing the returns rather than going on potential. Return. Yeah, the only real impact with the way we've set up the returns, um, which it's a sliding scale that we of what we're proposing. Time's actually what changes the, the the returns, not so much how much is invested. If you make sense, so um, we've calculated that if with the way we've set up the sliding scale of returns at two hundred head, uh, sorry, at seven years, it's four point better than four point two percent per annum return, uh, at 10 years, it actually works out to be 6%. So, yeah, so I think that was going to be my next question. So could you could you explain that mechanism and what, what's in it for the investor? You know, how, how that Because that's quite a large difference. If you annualise that 2% increase over the last period, that, that would, over an annualised period would suggest that you're getting quite a big kicker towards the end of the investment period. You are, you are. What we intend, what we're proposing is that because of the, the lag between carving, selling, and then so on, we're proposing that there's actually no return for the first two years, but then it rapidly increasing by 2% each following year, and then plateauing at 10%. So this is basically at seven years, you had 10%, but obviously over the lifespan of seven years, Turns out to be 4.2 every yeah, year. Better than 4.2. Yeah, and the longer the investor stays on, so we're obviously hoping after seven years to buy the investor out. Um, however, if they actually like the idea of staying on and getting more returns, we'd be happy to keep on going until the 10 year, um, where then obviously it's yeah, it's a better return over every single year for them. Yeah, great. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. This is great. I love the, you know, we spent a lot of time pulling apart these different options and I hope people are enjoying this just to see the various options that are available to you to pull these things together. Tony, we've got one minute. Um, over to you for your question. Yeah, really quickly. Thanks, Sandy and Catherine. Um, the Regen Ag space, uh, and you mentioned the local markets, is there uh, any premium that you're expecting from the uh, either Regen approach or um, or not? Um, oh, sorry. You wanna... Yeah. Yes and no. There is a slight premium for for re, for grass fed. It's not significant. What I'm looking at is actually the cost margin difference of producing it conventionally versus producing it. So I'm trying to basically maximise the current platform. Basically, our inputs are very low into the land, so our margin is way bigger yeah, than if we had a high input farm. Well, we intend to maximise the gross margin rather than actually um, worry about really. Well, we, we are going to be chasing obviously niche markets with Wagyu and and with actually doing the regenerative ag and those sorts of niches. But realistically, it's the gross margin that's more important to us. Than it would be nice to see that obviously, and hopefully that's the way it's all going, especially with cultivate obviously being involved in these things. So hopefully we can see somewhere someone bringing this up to actually get yeah, get paid for the really good stuff that we're doing. Excellent, thanks. Well done, Andy and Catherine. We'll wrap uh, up there. Um, now we're gonna move over to the Eastern side of Australia. Um, and we have Joel Simmons and Caitlin Robertson. 
Hi, I'm Joel Simmons. I'm Caitlin. I'm Ellie Joe. I am Rosa. And this is Ray. Right. <laughs> Caitlin and I are mixed enterprise broadacre farmers that have a love for farming and restoring the land. We produce cereal and legume crops as well as sheep for the meat market. We are located in the Mildura region, which is northwest of Victoria. We would like to give you the opportunity to invest in us and for you to purchase rundown farming property with the aim to rapidly improve capital growth using your funding for infrastructure and our well aligned management practices we can achieve this. We will also be offering a good cash return by our lease of the property, which will also include our management. We are planning to be ready to purchase the right farm at the right price the moment it becomes available. We are searching for a farm with these criteria and this is a good example. Kira Station, which is 40 kilometres west of Mildura. Kira has a lot of potential and room to improve. This property is 1,400 hectares and suits a mixed farming enterprise well as some of the country is well suited for cropping and the rest is suited to run stock on native pastures. There is also the potential for future irrigation developments as there are creeks running through the property as well as being close to pumping sites. Property price including infrastructure costs needed will be 9 million and the cash return for the lease we will be paying you is 3%. With the cost of our operations to be managed the property, we will be asking for 50% of the capital growth produced at the end of a 10 year term. In recent years, our area has been through a severe drought. Over this period, we can see there is a big need for improvement of management practices to prevent soil erosion from wind and the need to re rebuild depleted soils with regenerative farming practices, as they aren't performing as well as they would have been before conventional farming. We feel with the passion we have for the land and the ability to adapt to new management practices, we can make this happen. In the cropping program, we will be keeping tillies to a minimum and using methods to control weed seeds to minimise chemical use. With good rotation and pasture management, we can improve soil biology to retain moisture, ground cover and soil fertility. With grazing, we will be erecting fences so we can manage stock movement well for regenerating native vegetation and pasture, which will be also retained ground cover. The tamer yards will be built to contain stock from grazing on paddocks through dry periods, which will be storing fodder that we produce to keep the stock in good condition while preserving native vegetation and paddocks. Stock can also be used to minimise the impact on unwanted pests and cropping countries, such as mice and snails. We also plan to do tree plantings to help with the wind erosion and carbon emissions. And we love farming. Well done, Joel, and well done, Caitlin. Um, I think uh, Caitlin can't be here today, but Joel is here. Let's throw straight away to the panel. Nigel, do you want to kick us off? Um, thank you very much for the presentation, guys. Uh, have you guys got a long history in that area, in that location? Yeah, we've, um, well, grew up in the area um, on the family farm originally. And um, yeah, we just don't farm at the moment now um yeah but uh moved away for a couple of years but uh have returned and uh caitlin is only been in the farming game for six years but um yeah she's quite involved in it now and, and are there a few farms around for sale up there uh they're coming up and going pretty quickly at the moment uh, victoria is sort of um, lacking in land availability um, the price has gone up a bit, but it has, I don't think it's seen the full extent of it. So I'm just sort of looking for to get in there first, I guess, um, yeah, before they really rapidly rise. Yeah, that was my um, my my question was with this these land prices in Victoria and, and what's happening is uh, you know uh, being careful about viability and what investment has to go into farms like this to make them you know, productive. So it sounds like you've thought about that and, and are well aware of the market situation. <laughs> that is good. Um, who have I got next? Uh, Will. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, uh, Joel. Um, so my question is um, the $9 million, how much of that is for the property purchase and how much 
will be required to improve the, the farm. If, the, if I can sort of summarise the thesis being you're going to buy a property that's more run down and make it more efficient and, and build those capital gains through having a, a better performing farm. So what's the mix between land and, and improvements? So uh, this property um, be purchased at eight million, be an extra million for improvements. Yeah. Um, the the half of me and um, venting mainly because that's um, the part that struggles. Then the other half on uh, water infrastructure and uh, wool sheds and uh, water. Yeah, and and that's the investors bringing nine. What what are you and Caitlin bringing to the table? So the management of the property. Um, yeah, what we're going to uh, the work we can do like fencing and. Um, putting the water infrastructure in and yep. um, it's been such a big property it, it will take a lot of effort. Yeah, great. And and I suppose if I was going to play devil's advocate and I wasn't invested with, with $9 million, what would the answer be for so the alternative would be just to buy a $9 million property myself and get 100% of the capital appreciation over that 10-year period? Why, why, would they, why should they invest with you and have that capital appreciation uh, rather than going them themselves. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess um, going by my capabilities, I can't really um, show you that. Um, the getting involved with me, I'm sure that um, I can prove myself, and as well as Caitlin, um, just our commitment to it as well. Right. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, Tony. G'day, Joel. Thanks for the presentation. I um, bloody Will told, took all my questions. I had similar questions, but um, let me ask you just about that um, that investment, the staff. Um, you know, how how is it in that area for getting people on? Um, noting that uh, you said that you could probably do a fair bit of that yourself with Caitlin, but. Um, that capital infrastructure is kind of interesting to me and um, how you can get the resources to keep it going, I suppose. Any, any plans there? Yeah, so um, the plan would be to have another worker on as well to do it all. Um, locally, Mildura is a pretty big place and I know quite a few uh, young people that would love to be in the broad acre farming game, but they just can't be. Um, just leave it at the farms around because they're so big too. Um, so I don't believe that would be an issue. Yep. Okay. And the only other question, Sam, sorry, quick one, just about the risks. Um, uh, some of the pictures in that, that presentation were pretty stark. Um, the water, fair investment in water infrastructure, I imagine? Yeah, there is. Yep. Um, this property uh, has got a fair bit of that anyway. Um, the, the main part is the uh, stock management part of it with fencing. Um, been able to shift them around, uh, keep cover on the paddocks and et cetera. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We'll go to Bert and I think Adam will have a question as well. So over to you, Bert. Oh, thanks, Joel. Um, so Joel, just a question around, I think you mentioned buying degraded assets um, and with your management techniques, you know, catalyzing their improvement. Are you able to just share um, what sort of time you think it's going to take you to get those farms into a condition that's going to start, you know, being profitable, knowing that you've, you're demonstrating, and I think you're, you're um, committing to a 3% um, a, a lease. Is it, is it a return? A 3% return, yeah. Can you talk us through when you think, I mean, are you going to be able to pay that in the early years while you're developing these farms and rehabilitating them, or is that going to be more back-ended? So I'm keeping that one pretty broad. Um, I will be trying to bring in other people um, in this as well um, to farm the place uh, with the power to be able to do it. Um, I reckon it'd be at least five years to sort of get the property up to scratch. Um, and the five years after that, well, you, yeah, you're going to see the real benefits. It will take some time. <laughs> and, you're, and you're comfortable you can pay those annual returns of 3% in those early years? I'll be making sure I'm re researching farm business um, quite well before I go ahead with anything. So, thanks, Joel. 
Thank you, Bert. And Adam? Um, Joel, this strategy of buying unneeded property and renovating, sort of using your best practice. What's um, that Kira example is worth eight mil now? If that was in the condition you know you can bring it up to within five years, what would it be valued at? For you know, speculatively, what would you think it'd be valued at if it was in the sort of condition you know you could bring it bring it into within five years? Put a put a number on it. Too um, <laughs> I've worked on uh, more a ten year period. Okay, and, uh, say ten years in. Yeah. Yep, and only working on the seven point seven percent increase of capital growth in Northwest Victoria. That would uh, increase in ten million. What end of ten year term? Um, but that's not including, uh, well, it's including improvements and whatever, but uh, being in a regenerative state, I think that would add more. And given that there's a surge in prices right now, is there still opportunity to buy farms that are slightly undervalued or buy them well because of this, um, you know, the degradation through to water and drought and so on? They have been coming up and staying on the market for a little bit. They're not selling within the two-week period. Like they have been down um, South Victoria. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, it will be getting harder to do that. Okay. Yeah, cool. Well done. Well done. Well done, Joel and, and Caitlin. Um, we will wrap that one up there and we'll move on. We've got two more to go. I'm just loving this. I am just super proud of all the farmers putting them out, themselves out there. Well done, Joel. Um, let's now go to South Australia, uh, Emma and Jordan Koch. Hello, I'm Jordan. This is Emma, and these are our four kids. Today, we're going to take you on a journey and show you a property that's going to bring all of our passions together. Welcome to Grand Prairie Estate. Welcome to your opportunity to a sound financial return, focusing on innovative farming principles that rejuvenate the land in a world-renowned mining community. We're presenting to you Grand Cru Estate, a mixed farming and tourism enterprise situated in Springton, South Australia, in the Barossa Valley. Grand Cru Estate consists of 294 acres, including 35 acres of wines, and the balance of the land being for grazing and cropping. In addition to the land, a huge draw card is the restaurant cellar door, winery and function centre, which has in recent times been popular with weddings. We have been leasing Grand Cru Estate for the previous 12 months and we are uniquely suited to add value to the enterprise, bringing our mix of skills of farming and the wedding industry. We established in 2017 on the back of three generations of farming. Up until now, we have been focused on building assets with all returns being invested into livestock and machinery, putting us in the perfect situation to move forward onto our next phase of owning our own farm. The Brossa Valley makes up 35% of the South Australian tourism market, making this a strong investment in a proven financially profitable region. Grand Cru has a long history of local community support with the addition of loyal Australian and overseas customers. The strength of the Barossa Valley is its winemaking and its grape growing. Here at Grand Cru, we have multiple varieties of grapes. We can show the customer the process of making the wine all the way through to the final product. We currently own 55 Black Angus cows and run over 300 sheep, producing both beef and prime lamb to the meat and wool industry. We wish to bring our produce directly to the consumer in the form of paddocks to plate through the functioning restaurant. Agriculture, although such a large part of the Australian industry and history, has in recent times experienced poor publicity regarding animal husbandry techniques and a stigma of leaving a detrimental carbon footprint. We want to bring the greater community to the farm door and show that through tourism, they're using ethical farming practices and innovative techniques that the future is in agriculture and that the land can be left healthier and more productive than when we arrived. We want to build this property to be a hub for the Eden Valley, marketing wine and tourism to the area, a farm that we can call ours, creating a legacy for our four children and a foundation to further grow our farming enterprise. We're seeking investors to assist us with the initial purchase of Grand Cru. 
We are taking this unique opportunity to purchase Grand Cru Estate for $3 million and will be rapidly increasing its value back to its former glory. Do you want to be part owner of this breathtaking winery and all it has to offer? This is available to up to five investors by way of a unit trust valued at $300,000 for each unit with attractive commercial returns. Please come with us on a journey to be a part owner of this amazing Barossa winery. Well done, Emma and Jordan. Uh, Barossa sounds pretty good. Uh, Will, how does it sound to you? Hi, the region well, Sam. Um, so um, thanks, Jordan and, and Emma. Um, I suppose um, exciting opportunity. And my question is, what, what do you see the business going forwards? Is it agritourism, hospitality? Is it events? Is it agriculture? Or is it a mixture of all four? And if, if it's the mixture, how do you prioritise? You know, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? Um, how, do you, how do you run a business that's that complex? Yeah, so I suppose um, uh, the current owner's um, in a position that he previously has, has and sorry, in answer to your question to start with, it is a mixture. It's all all of those things. Um, but, uh, you know, um, with my experience in the farming in the industry and my history with farming, and then um, prior to this, Emma's also got a wedding um, flower and function business. Um, so she brings that to the table. Um, we've been running the property for 12 months already. Um, and, and that consists of all those avenues. Um, obviously we're just going through vintage at the moment. Um, yeah, the restaurant runs, um, three days a week, um, just over the weekend, cellar doors all week. Um, and then Evan has got the functions and, and restaurant going in the background as well. So, um, initially it, it would be we're obviously managing ourselves. Um, we already have a number of staff members through the restaurant um, and, and have relatives as well that have been helping with, you know, things like gardening and stuff, just to those little jobs that I haven't got to do. Um, I've got people that can assist me with that. Um, obviously moving forward uh, and, in, and the properties heyday, there, there was up to 27 staff at any one point. Um, we'd like to move forward and, and, and employ people to do that, but um, that's uh, that'll be a, a, a time thing um, as, as things increase, as we increase the, the production and things like that, um, then we'll employ more staff and whatnot. Yeah, great. I, I would really encourage you to, to explore or to expand on your prior histories because that's going to be important for an investor to understand that you can actually get create values out of those various and quite diverse um, opportunities of the business. And then perhaps just on the, the, the structure, the unit trust structure and um, why you've created it that way and, and what does the end game look like for an investor? What sort of term are you looking at for an investment? Yeah, so the, uh, that was only, we're open to you know, any, any negotiations with investors, um, but the way that we uh, envisage doing it is obviously by that way of unit trust, um, potentially five investors with um, three, $320,000 um, and, and that includes obviously the fees for the purchase, not just the purchase itself. Um, and then we go through commercial lending and, and grants, whatever else to get the remaining 60%. Um, and, you know, but obviously if there was more investors or someone wanting to invest more, we're open to negotiations for that as well. Great, thanks, good luck. Thank you, Will, Tony. Thanks, Jordan and Emma. Um, love the idea of the business. I'm going to just go down a bit further down the path than Will. The um, in the presentation, you know, you mentioned a couple of times, and um, and Jordan, you uh, you said about the the existing business, and so what sort of capital investment to get it up to where it was? Used, I think they used the term um, former glory or something. So is it? How run down is a business and what sort of capital is in needed to get it up to running space? And I'm also interested, are you currently sort of managing the, the restaurant or is that another separate sort of business that you don't have much say in? That's the second question. Yeah, so um, basically it was on the market a few years back for $5.1 million. Um, that was when it was basically looking spectacular. The gardens were phenomenal the ex-wife of the place, she was actually a horticulturist by trade. So the, they used to hold garden days, open garden days to the public. That's how spectacular it was. And um, 
we're hoping to restore the gardens to what they were um, before. And the business that's currently running there um, at the moment, the restaurant, we are the managers of that. Um, we are running that now. Um, we do have the current owner helping us out with that as well as a staff member. Um, the bed and breakfast and Airbnb are currently running as well as a different income stream. The current owner runs that part of it. Um, we're just doing the restaurant, the functions and the farming land at the moment. Um, but we really want to bring all of it together and run all of it as one big enterprise and have all of those options available. And so in regards to the capital um, that it's going to take to get it back up to that, it's not so much capital as in probably just more hard work um, and, and, and not, not a lot of monetary. Um, the vineyards are still functioning. Like there, there is a section of vineyard that uh, later down the track we do plan to um, rejuvenate. Um, it's, it it uh, needs just, you know, revamping and want to replant that into Shiraz instead of at the moment at Chardonnay. Um, but, but initially it's more probably marketing um, and just our, our, our hard work. Um, even in the period of time that we've had it in the last 12 months, um, you know, we've obviously noticed a steady increase in the customer base and, and people that were coming, you know, as a regular thing, the locals are the bread and butter sort of thing for the rest, restaurant side of things when you're a little bit slower with your functions and whatnot. Um, and we've already, you know, noticed a steady increase in those people coming back. Excellent. Thank you. Matt. Ah, uh, thanks, Emma and Jordan. Um, Couple of questions. The first one is, um, I think you're saying, and it's it's now worth three point two million this asset, and it and it had, you know, it's been let go a bit. Can you give me a breakdown of the value of the improvements as opposed to the value of the land at the moment? So, in, in regards to like the winery and the restaurant and things like that, or yeah, so the, the improvements as opposed to the value of the land. Yeah. Um, so I suppose the value of the land um, is a little bit dependent and it has the, the infrastructure plays a part in it. The fact that the vineyards are on there, that land with vineyards on there or established vineyards is obviously worth a lot more. Um, but the, the general community that, aren't, that don't have vineyards and it's just the land for hay and livestock production, um, you know, it's, it's quite a, a great deal less, obviously. Um, you know, that, that range is as well for the property and the other infrastructure involved, I suppose, um, you know, but looking at vineyard land, there's other vineyards on the market. They're sort of between the five to $7,000 an acre for established vineyards. Um, that's without the other infrastructure, like your, the winery and the cellar door and the restaurant and things like that as well. Um, the specific breakdown, I suppose there's 330 acres. So if you just, um, produced like if you just stated that as a, a, a figure just as grazing or livestock production and hay land then you're probably talking you know 1500 to 1700 dollars an acre um, as opposed to you know the whole thing does that answer it or not really no that's okay I've, I've calculated that out while we're talking that's good um, second question is um, just quickly we're we're in the agriculture industry we're in accommodation, we're in um, food service. If you had a weakness, what is your weakness as a team? Yeah, so probably oh, I would say it's the um, just the, the winemaking side of it. Um, Emma's got significant history in hospitality um, and has adopted that for obviously her weddings and function business. Um, and so she brings that to the table and then I've got extensive broad acre cropping and, and livestock um, you know experience but it's probably the wine making side of things but like i said we've got the previous owner who who obviously is you know okay. um mentoring us but pretty pretty oh he's got a you know it's 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 his life so you know he's got a keen interest to see that the place goes somewhere and and you know he's quite happy teaching us all the all the wine making and the and the you know vineyard maintenance and stuff excellent thank you Thank you, Bert. Adam, we'll throw to you and we have an audience question we'll get to as well. Um, well done, Emma and Jordan. That was great. Uh, two quick ones. Uh, how long ago, just clarifying, how long ago was it valued at 5.1, 5, 5 I think you said? How long ago was that? Uh, end of 2018, I believe. Gotcha. All right. 
Well, so it's a good, there's undervalue there. And what's the, um, as an investor, if I put 300K into this as a unit holder, um, do I get some level of, uh, is, a, is there a lifestyle element for the, in this for me as an investor? As yeah, a, definitely. As a, you know, ownership, yeah. Yes, certainly. Like um, you've got, you know, the accommodations there and the, the restaurant and whatever else, you know, we, we would be open, we'd be inviting for the investor to, you know, come on occasion and stay. And, you know, then when the wine's being produced on the property, you know, um, the availability to do a label in an investor's name or, or, you know, a few cases of wine to of each variety that comes across and things like that, you know. Great. All right. Thank you. It's awesome. And I missed Nigel. Apologies, Nigel is doing so well, but we'll come back to you, mate. I, I, I think uh, everybody's uh, covered it very well. Congratulations, Emma and Jordan. I like the diversified sort of paddock to plate model um, and, and the mix of skills that you've both got. I'm, I'm curious how, how, how much you've been able to research the weddings and function uh, market, because I sort of see that as your cash flow saviour uh, in many ways. Yeah, so um, I've had a wedding florist business for just over four years now. Um, and so that's grown uh, between two and threefold every year since I started it. So um, it's a lot of word of mouth from that. But basically with every wedding I do, I tend to get another three booked. So I've got a lot of experience with all of the um, different vendors involved in the wedding industry. And I've also got 20 one years of hospitality experience. Um, so I've worked many functions, many restaurants um, and a lot of big catering companies. So I've sort of been mentored along the way of to sort of touch base on all of those aspects of hospitality and the tourism industry. So that part I'm extremely confident in. Um, uh, it's just the winery side of it that's all new to us and all very exciting. Oh, thanks for clarifying that, Emma. That's re really important bit of information you just gave us then. Thank you. So we've got um, Steve has provided a comment in uh, in a formal, which is great. Love that. And uh, got a couple of questions from Duncan. I'll pick one just to keep it time. Uh, and it's um, around interest in the vineyard management story. Emma and Jordan, if there's enough of a question in that one for you, is enough for you to build off? Um, so that. is that is it a breakdown of what the vineyard consists of, or just how it's managed? Or let's go with the last house managed. Let's go with that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously that's part that that's our weakness. But um, in the twelve months that we have been there and running it, um, we you know when the vines are going dormant or through their dormant stage after pruning, um, the livestock goes in, and that that you know that saves on any chemical costs and and you know even slashing and pet, you know, diesel costs and things like that. So um, we have been running obviously the farming enterprise um, in conjunction with the wines. You know, um, we're at the process at the point now where um, last week we were out picking Cabernet. This week we're going to be picking Chardonnay, and um, you know that that's all getting processed on site. Um, we've we've got the Cabernet in tank in uh, fermenting at the moment, and um, the Chardonnay will ferment in barrel later this week. Brilliant! It all sounds great uh, to me, anyway. Um, thank you very much, to you both. Well done. And uh, now we're on to our very last pitch, our seventh pitch. Courtney and Ian Congdon over in southern New South Wales. Uh, Courtney and Ian were part of the previous cultivator program, but we wanted to get them in for here as well to, to pitch uh, also. So uh, we'll play that and then Courtney and Ian, chuck your cameras on when you're ready. Hi, we're Ian and Courtney and we run Woodstock Flower, a flower milling operation based in Berrigan, New South Wales. We are committed to restoring our region's landscape and rejuvenating our community through grain, local food, biodiversity and regenerative farming. We're seeking investors to join us in the purchase of a 95 acre farm, Aberdeen in Rutherglen, Victoria. Currently we process certified organic grain grown by Ian's family to produce freshly milled stone ground flour that we distribute across Victoria and New South Wales. With such strong demand for our product, we're currently at capacity and we wish to expand to meet our growing waiting list of customers. Through Woodstock Flour, we're recognised as one of Australia's finest flour producers. We've considered leaders in the local grains movement and we've built a really strong following for our respected brand. This week, we'll be putting in an offer of 990,000 for the 95 acre farm in Rutherland. 
and we're seeking 30% from investors in the form of loans. We will provide a 6% per annum return to the investors and we'll pay these back over six years. Aberdeen will allow us to expand our flour mill, which we'll build on the farm, and regeneratively grow crops to value add through the mill. We expect to produce around 25 tonnes of grain per year and we'll continue to purchase and mill grain from Ian's family and our local network of regenerative growers. We see the flour mill as having great potential to create landscape change on a large scale by providing a premium for regeneratively grown grain and thereby incentivizing farmers in transitioning to regenerative practices. We believe this is a great low risk opportunity for an investor seeking not only financial returns, but social and environmental impact too. We will increase soil carbon from one to 5% over 10 years. Investors will receive 50% of carbon credit income. We will actively restore biodiversity through native pastures and shelter belts. We will use our platform to educate people about regenerative ag and we will continue to work with the local Indigenous community, notably Bruce Pascoe's Black Duck Foods on edible native grains. Our approach to business and risk management is centred around holistic planning, regular monitoring, relationship building and facilitating diversity across multiple levels. We're committed to building a relationship with the investor and we look forward to them joining us on this journey of regenerating land and connecting community through grain. Thanks. Thank you, Courtney and Ian. Thank um, you. <laughs> cheers. You are out and about at the conference in Albury today, so thank you for uh, joining. <laughs> Let's kick it off. I think we'll start with Bert. Oh, hi, guys. It's um, good to see hi. you again. Um, <laughs> I've just got a question around your 50% sharing of carbon credits. Can you outline your proposed crediting periods and under what pro, um, methodology you'll be using? Are you going under the Climate Solutions Fund or under a voluntary project? We're still, yeah, still working that out. Um, this is something that we're, um, we've been discussing with an investor about and they're interested in us pursuing it, but we haven't um, laid down any of the, the framework that yeah. would... So we're open to negotiation and open to figuring that out. But yeah, we're pretty keen to get baselines as yeah. soon as possible. And then sort of once we've got that, we know it can work from there. And have you, have you modelled out your generation based on historical data in terms of your generational history? Yeah, so we the potential on the family farm. Um, and we're amping that up a bit because we're being on a smaller farm and with higher rainfall, um, we believe we've got higher potential than what we've what we've seen on the family farm. So, yeah. and just based on um, neighbouring farms as well, just seeing what their potential is too. And what they're starting to get. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And just my final question is around: as you're building up uh, markets and whatnot, how are you spreading the production risk throughout the sort of supplier base that you're tapping into to help? Um, you know, build your supply. How are you kind of managing that production risk now? Um, well, currently we have a good year, two years worth of um, grain in the silos. Um, wow. That's pretty, pretty good. Um, and we're also, it's still quite a small amount of grain, um, I guess, in terms of the commodity market, um, only looking to be milling 100 tonne to 150 tonne in a year. Um, which could, you know, we could feasibly look to be producing, you know, 30 tonne a year quite easily off this 100 acres. That's only going to take another couple of um, interested farmers who we've got already got those relationships with, we feel, um, to supplement that. And we're looking to have two, like two different kind of product lines. So we'll have our current certified organic line and then we're also looking into developing a bit of a standard for regeneratively grown grain and just trying to nut out what that would look out look like so we can um yeah diversify in terms of what grain is going through the mill and how we can better support the immediate community here excellent thank you have fun thanks. down there cheers <laughs> thanks bert nigel hi hi guys again hi. um Interested in your relationship you're working on with uh, Bruce Pascoe and um, what, what, what the potential is there? Yeah, so we uh, at the moment just kind of, uh, I guess, contract milling for them. So um, they bring over grain 
for us to mill and then we're kind of working together working out um what the product could be so just um troubleshooting on the grain processing side of things um not so much the growing side of things at, at this stage um so yeah they source the grain and we're kind of on the product development stage we're hoping to launch um a product in may june depending on how things go um and that will be like the start of hopefully um a few more different products to come um yeah there's just been lots of challenges with the processing side of things and working out um how to clean these little seeds and then how best to process them but yeah it's kind of a it's a partnership and um at the moment where the kind of contract millers oh that's really interesting um where, where where would you like to see yourselves in three three years time in five years time as a business um i guess we're kind of trying to position the mill in a way that services the community so um we want to grow the mill in a at a scale that that suits our family um and in a way that can incentivize other growers so we're kind of looking at having four different mills is the, is the current trajectory um so that's producing around 200 or more tons of grain a year um and yeah seeing trying to position the mill in a way that um it's not not just processing farmers grain but also promoting regenerative ag and and providing a platform to educate um educate farmers in the region and yeah i guess this farm is a it's a stepping stone for us like it's quite a small block but it'll get us in the property market and um, hopefully see us being able to manage land on a larger scale in, in 10 years time. Yeah. Yeah. We'd eventually like to set the mill up as a sort of self-sufficient um, thing where we could um, have that. Yeah. Working by itself almost, and we can produce grain for it as well. Thank you. Thanks. Adam. Uh, Tony. Thanks, Ian and Courtney. Um, I got a couple of questions, and I'll just try and make them quick. The, the, um, so is the is the business to grow into a milling business and a farming business? Just to pick up on your point there, I think Courtney around four mills or something. Um, and I'm also yeah. interested in the uh, the regen versus organic and the branding of that. And I think you talked about educating farmers around that. But I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on educating consumers, if there's going to be a, um, a marketing mix between organic and or regen. So it's educating. Is it educating farmers and consumers or, or just one? Yeah, I guess it's, it's both. Like, so at the moment, we're definitely educating consumers. Um, so we have a pretty strong um, social network following and a newsletter. And we're often doing events. Um, we have workshops. So we're definitely educating consumers at the moment um and that's around regenerative organic practices is our focus um but where we see huge potential in our region because it's a farming region um is actually trying to educate farmers as well and like promoting or i guess demonstrating certain practices in our region um so it, it's a it's a level of both but at the moment we're mostly focused on consumers but we'd yeah. like to grow it to be able to educate farmers too Excellent. Thanks. Um, and the other question around was it around whether we're a milling or a farming business is that yeah. correct yeah so currently we're based on ian's family's farm um and we we work there but the flour mill is our enterprise and that's our main um business so we're looking for a small farm to kind of to branch out and have the farm as well yeah. So it'd be a vert vertically integrated business. Yeah. And farm. this farm in Rutherglen has access to power that's good enough to support the new mill. Um, whereas at the farm currently, we don't have that. Um, yeah, so it means we can sort of, we can move in pretty much straight away, double our production. And then um, in that sort of three to five years time, maybe build a new facility with greater production again. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. And Will, uh, just before I go to you, I've got um, someone saying, uh, it is Dave saying, yeah. Jason Cotter at Turong is doing something similar, if you know of him. Yeah, so, he's a good friend of ours. Great. Yeah. Excellent. And, there we go. <laughs> and I think you planted a, a customer because someone says, uh, Mel says you're amazing. So obviously well planted. Uh, oh. <laughs> now, uh, let's say uh, last one uh, for Will. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks, Courtney and Ian. Uh, great presentation. Um, I, I had a similar question, which I think has just been answered around the, the why. Uh, I couldn't understand why you'd want to invest in land if you're about milling and, and would the greatest constraint be actually more suitable product rather than land itself? But I think you just answered that in the last question there. That um, I suppose then to get to the specifics of the offer for the investor you're offering, you've described it as a, as a loan, so debt investors as opposed to equity investment. Um, why should an investor put up debt rather than equity and, and not share in any potential capital appreciation? And, and have you thought about those various structures you could take? Yeah, so we've been playing with the idea of a unit trust as well. Um, but there's been a few, I don't know, we've had a few reservations around, uh, I guess, the complexity of that. And and if you're buying a property off the market, whether whether we can we can do that in the time frame available because properties sell hotcakes around here. So that's one of our concerns with the unit trust and, and the complexities. Um, but we're definitely open to it. Like we're not ruling it out at all. Um, it's just that we've been talking to an investor and um, they've suggested this kind of framework and, and we yeah. thought it matched it. We thought it sounded good. So we've kind yeah. of followed that path, um, but we're definitely open to other options as long as, yeah, it's not too complicated and the time frame um, is suitable. Yeah. yeah, I think that certainly debt would have that simplicity in its favour and 6% return in this market would be quite attractive. What what sort of loan evaluation ratio would the investor debt, debt provider be accepting? So how much are you putting in yourselves? Uh, 10%. So the bank's happy um, we can put up 40%. Yeah. Right. And the 6% return for the debt provider, how much of that will be from the carbon credit uh, income or is that going to be on, on top of that? That's on top. Right. Yeah. But we kind of said that the investor would help us um, uh, set up the baseline for the carbon credits as well. So they would be pitching in for the whole establishment of the, the carbon, carbon counting. Yeah. Right. Excellent. All right. Thanks, guys. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Ian and Courtney, and well done to everybody. That is the end of the pitching program. We're going to do a few little follow-up questions. One more question to the panel, one more question to one of the farmers, and then we'll do a wrap-up uh, and be uh, out of here very soon. But I just want to say thank you to everyone. Super impressed, super proud. Uh, well done. The question I'm going to ask the panel, I'll do a follow-up. I'll, I'll chase up one question uh, while you think about this answer panel, uh, but just want to get you to give one key observation or one comment uh, after hearing all those pictures panel, I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, but James McGill uh, asked, how many farmers are ready for due diligence? And I'll interpret that as uh, you know, farmers ready to go and pull apart a farm with a partner. Uh, and I'd say about half so far, people will correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the farmers know what they want. They've just got to find that, that farm. But I think Emma and Jordan, Andy and Catherine, Courtney and Ian and Mal have properties or are ready for um, getting investors. The others are ready as well. They just want to build a partnership and find that piece of dirt to buy given how quickly farms are, are being purchased. Um, so I think they're all ready, just at different stages and um, readiness of the land available. And then this question is bank from James as well. Is bank debt an option? Uh, and absolutely. Uh, and that's something that you, that, you know, this is a negotiation between two parties to figure that out. Um, you know, debt, any form of uh, uh, finance would be up on the table, I, I'd assume with these discussions. So absolutely a key part of it. Um, so there's a question that we had. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to throw it to the panel and I'll do one question to, uh, we're going to do Andy and Hayden, actually, uh, now that Hayden's joined us. But we'll go to the panel first. Um, we'll start with you, Bert. What, just one, one key observation or comment in a wrap-up. Thanks, Sam. And um, we've got to commend these guys. It's very confronting to talk to over 100 people, and, and, and it is virtual, and they've put a lot of time and energy into this. So well done, guys. It's, it's not easy, and you've done a really great job. I think... Um, um, others will probably touch on other aspects of what um, makes you investable and what makes you investor ready. 
I think the comment I would just leave you with is um, just think about um, one thing we can sometimes overlook and, and a few of the panel today have spoken about risk. Think about risk for the investor. And I think that'll really help you build into your uh, financial model and your pitch um, that you've taken all of that risk into account. Um, some of you have, of course, and some could probably do a bit more. But um, again, well done. Um, congratulations. It's, it's not easy and can be somewhat confronting. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Bert. Great observations. Will, what's your comment or feedback? Thank you, Sam. Um, well, I think first, congratulations to everyone. They were great presentations and, and it's really quite evident how much passion is out there and how excited everyone is about their business and their business opportunities. So, so congratulations on that. I think my comment is going to be similar to Bert. I would encourage you to put yourself in the shoes of the investor when you're pitching like this. And when you think about the audience that's, that's on this call, you could almost take it as a given that they like agriculture and they want to invest in agriculture. You're almost preaching to the converter. So then the question is, why should they invest in your opportunity over and above any other opportunity in agriculture? And, and bringing it back to that risk-adjusted return, which is sort of a, a banking terminology but for the return that you're generating and the risk that you're accepting why is your opportunity better than any other um, so if it is a, a relatively lower return you need to be able to demonstrate that it's lower because it's, it's a much less risk for the investor and vice versa if it's a higher return why that's appropriate for the opportunity that you're providing but um, once again Sam congratulations to all the presenters and thanks very much for having us. Great observation Will thank you. Tony? unmute myself uh yeah look can i just say um congratulations guys as well i'm super impressed with the passion and the um the thought and the preparation that's gone into this so um sincerely and genuinely really well done um i was going to echo uh bert's comment i think just around the risk um it, it I think that has to be a key part of it going forward. What I was impressed with, though, is that all of the pitches um, really looked at that whole supply chain type of approach and marketing and where the product was going and, you know, the various aspects that might make it um, uh, consumable and, you know, make it uh, have, a, have a competitive place on the shelf or in, in the market. So I really, um, I think that's a, a key part that investors might be looking for is, um, you know, the, there's a lot of commodities out there. How, what's your product different? And, and where's your niche in the, in the market, which um, I think came through in all the pitches. So congratulations again on thinking that part of the, the story because I think that's really important. Thank you, Tony. And Nigel, your, your final thoughts. Thanks, Sam. Um, thank you for all the pitches. Um, I just found it fascinating uh, uh, with the breadth of, um, of proposals uh, put there. So congratulations to Sam and Adam as well for, for working with the these guys and um, and and putting up uh, investment opportunities that are, that are they're all are all quite different. Um, I think they're really you know you you all present very authentically and genuinely and 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 the hard work and that sort of perseverance aspect are, are all really key attributes for um, investors to to have the confidence that they can trust and uh, and and back people. It's a it's a big task for an investor to um, to undertake. Uh, backing young people coming through uh, the cultivator program um, and so the more that I guess my my main thing is the deeper you can um, make a connection with the investor so that um, uh, when you start discussions you're, um, you're 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 getting as much information to them as, as possible and you and the way you keep in contact with investors if you get invested um, so that when difficulties arise for you um, it, uh, everybody's well aware of what can happen going forward. So I'm probably looking beyond your investors in, in, in your pitches just right now. But the next step, hopefully, is that you're going to engage with investors, and and that engagement is going to be really important. No, absolutely, Nigel. Really great advice. And we'll talk quickly about what next steps are with the farmers. Uh, but I just want to quickly throw to Hayden and Andy, just a bit of a wrap up from your point of view, like what is your why? And, and I think your answer might cover all the other farmers part of the program as well. But what's this why? Why have you gone on this journey? And what, you know, what is your why for, for life as well? Uh, hi, everyone. And apologies for not being here earlier. Um, I suppose probably the main why for us is uh, we've grown up on farms. We've been, uh, I've been managing the current farm I'm on for 10 years and working on it for 15 and uh, we've reached a point in our life where we're wondering why 
um, you know, we're doing this for someone else and not for ourselves. You know, we, we, we came and started managing this farm and it was probably uh, one of the more average farms in the district. And over time, you know, we've, we've transformed it into being, you know, one of the leading farms in the district. And you, you kind of start to wonder to yourself, you know, why, why are you doing it for someone else? And we've, we've got a young family that we, we, we're, we're really excited with agriculture and we want to show them that it's, it's not just a place for, you know, big corporate companies and, and, and big players that, you know, that we can make a go of it, that there is a future and, and that we can do it all, um, you know, whilst, whilst being sustainable and, and looking after uh, the environment and, and, the, and the community. Oh, it is brilliant. And, you, you know, time and time again, that is the answer we're getting from, from farmers across the country is this um, get on and do something, you know, for yourself and your family and your community, um, supporting the environment all the way. It's brilliant. And we're, you know, again, very proud to be part of your journey, pulling this apart. Um, we will wrap up now. I'll do a bit of a where to next. Uh, from the farmer's point of view that have been part of the program uh, and these pictures as well, they now have, a document that they can take to investors, retiring farmers, the mayor, accountants, lawyers, and keep opening doors within their community and across Australia for people to partner with them. That is the power of this. Plus, they'll be full of confidence in being able to have those conversations. Like doing this pitch is massive um, for them to get out there. And, um, I know nearly everyone was overwhelmed with the idea of doing a three minute pitch and putting that out here on, um, you know, at this pitch event, but look at them, they've, they've just uh, thrived. And we want that to be a hope for other farmers out there that, you know, you can pull this together and you can get attention to get onto your farm. So all these farmers are going to be out there and in front of people having many coffee sessions and zoom chats to find partners uh, to get on their farm. Uh, Maria has got a comment in there around how uh, the farmers building relationships with aging farmers. That is all part of it as well. This pitch can be used for, for aging farmers and people in their network to say, hey, you know, I wanna own a farm. Uh, here's what I'm thinking and use that as a way to start the conversation. Uh, I just wanna thank everyone for, for coming. Um, I wanna quickly just hear from Adam as a bit of a summary uh, of the whole event and of the program. Uh, and then I'll, I'll do a wrap up uh, for the of the event, Adam. Well, thanks, Sam. Um, look, I'll just echo what, echoing what everyone else has already said. I'm really proud of you guys, and I think the diversity and the quality of what you're presenting is is fantastic. Um, and as you know, Bert mentions, there's a big difference between building a business pitch out uh, in at home and you know planning a business, and there's a it's another thing to get up. In front of an audience and present it. They're two different skill sets, and you guys have learnt this particular one of presenting this in, in a mad hurry. Um, and you've done an exceptional job in presenting your business plan. So, but I, well done to you guys. I just want to probably comment again to those who are listening as as investors, and you're thinking about taking the next step here. Um, for my money, looking at a business, it's always comes down to who's the key drivers, who are the key people behind this business as to what's it's going to make it successful or not. And I believe by virtue, these people here you see in front of you, these farmers, just by virtue of the fact they've chosen to step out of their comfort zone, sign up to a program like Cultivator and go out and become coachable, you know, experiment with being curious and being wrong and just unpacking everything they already thought they knew about themselves and go and learn this process and be open to it um, and put themselves on the knife's edge and really put themselves out there. It tells me, a whole lot about what sort of business people they're going to become and already are. Um, but those traits taken into business, I think are, are pretty solid things to invest in. So, you know, the fact they're here and there's a whole bunch of their, their colleagues who are not, who are set there, you know, either riding the wave or complaining it's not right. These guys are the movers and shakers of the industry. So um, to me, you guys are all investable. Um, I love what you're up to. And I think it's been a very inspiring afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, Adam. So I want to do a quick thank yous and, and then what to, what to next from people watching. Just want to thank the audience for people for attending. Really loved having you here uh, and for us to be able to present these pictures to the panel. They've all given their time for free to be here today. Really amazing and get their wisdom um, and insights. To the farmers, thank you again for putting yourselves out there uh, and to be going through this journey and pulling your pitch together. To Rural Bank for your ongoing support and specifically for the sport 
support provided by many mentors uh, across the country for these farmers. So to get in contact, please get in touch with me. There's my email. I've just put it in the chat, sam at cultivatefarms.com. If you want to talk to any of these farmers, um, uh, the, if you're an aspiring farmer, get inspired. Uh, we run cultivator programs a couple of times a year. There's also a pitching template you can download. We have free content everywhere on the internet that you can download and watch and, and listen and read um, about how to get onto your farm. Uh, investors get in touch, think about, you know, how do you uncover people within your own community? Or if you want to back some of these farmers, retiring farmers, please do think about it. And then in particular, it's a call out to people in regional communities who want to attract and keep the next gen on their farms and keep the older generation on their farms as well. Get in touch. We've got plenty of ideas of how we can support you to be a champion for your community. I'll throw it over for one final comment from any of the farmers if you just want to jump in and, and just give a quick summary and then we'll we'll call to an end. Who's going to do it? Check, go, Jesse. <laughs> I'll go. I just uh, wanted to say thanks so much to Sam and Adam and all our fellow cultivators. It's been so fantastic working with you all and learning more about what we're wanting to do and really figuring out our why and being able to share it with people in a, a judgment-free area has been really beneficial. And for us, having that weekly session, get it done, has been absolutely fantastic. We're really proud of what we've presented today. And yeah, we're really excited about our next steps. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Trent. Let's wrap it up there, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, spread the word, tell people what's happened here today, and let's, let's empower more and more farmers uh, next year, this year, for, for the next 10 years, let's get more good people onto the land. Thank you very much.